Uh, with that being said, let's pray, and then we'll get into uh, Nehemiah chapter 9. It's been a few weeks because of Easter. We went away from Nehemiah, so we'll just pray and then kind of give you a recap of the first nine chapters. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for the opportunity to be here today amongst your people. Lord, you inhabit the praises of your people. We thank you for that. Father, as we continue today to get into your holy word, I'd ask for help as the mouthpiece that you just separate my heart and my mouth right now, my mind, so, Lord, the people could be admonished and instructed and edified, and, Lord, that you would receive the glory for it all. We ask this in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, amen and amen. So to recap, Nehemiah, since it's been a few weeks, and we're now beginning the ninth chapter of a book that's 13 chapters, if you remember going back, we started in the new year, so we've spent what's going to end up being more than half of a year on Nehemiah when it's all said and done. Chapter 1 was the burden of Nehemiah when he received the burden to go back to Jerusalem where the gates were broken down, the walls were on fire, and there was, he was weeping and mourning and fasting and praying. Chapter 2, he got the blessing and favor of the king, Artaxerxes. Chapter 3, the building begun on the wall. Remember, people never thought it would be possible to do this. But we serve the God of the impossible. Chapter 4, the battle begins. Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem, the enemies of the rebuild emerge. Chapter 5, internal combustion. The people uh, of Jerusalem, the, the wealthier People were taking advantage, charging usury or interest from the poor. There wasn't enough food, so we had problems going on inside the camp as well as outside. Chapter 6, lies, threats, even death threats, and then the completion of the wall in chapter 6, verse 15, which took only 52 days. Chapter 7, Nehemiah appoints new leaders for the transition, Henani and Henaniah, new porter, uh, porters and Levites. He sets watch at the doors. Chapter 8, the book comes out, or the scroll, really, at that time. But the book, the scriptures say, come out, revival, celebration. It's the Feast of the Tabernacles. And now that brings us into chapter 9. And what chapter 8, since it's been a few weeks, was a time to feast, chapter 9 begins with a time to fast. See, there's a time to feast. There's a time to celebrate. Remember Nehemiah and Ezra said, stop your weeping. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Go and eat celebrate. And they remembered when God brought them through the wilderness and they had the Feast of the Tabernacles and they made these little tents, so to speak, in their homes, on top of their homes, outdoors. And they did this for a week. And now comes to a time of fasting. See, you have to recognize what's the right time to feast and when's the right time to fast. One thing I've noticed is this. I'm never going to feast when I know I'm going to go to a big dinner. It just doesn't work out well. Two things happen. Number one, you end up eating. Number two, everybody knows you're fasting if you don't eat. So I've learned over time, a time to fast is not when you have a wedding you're attending or you're invited to, let's say, Grandpa Sam's for dinner, okay? That's not a time to feast, or I'm sorry, not a time to fast. That's a time to feast. So you have to recognize this, and the Jewish people, considering the wall had been rebuilt, the Feast of the Tabernacles, the new year had been upon them, but this was on the 24th day, we'll get into it, was a time to fast. It says in verse 1 of chapter 9, Now in the 20th and 4th day of this month, as children of Israel, they were assembled with fasting and with sackcloth and earth upon them. Sackcloth and ashes were used in Old Testament times as a symbol of debasement, mourning, and or repentance. Someone wanting to show his repentant heart would often wear sackcloth, sit in ashes, and put ashes on the top of his head. Sackcloth was a coarse material, usually made of black goat's hair, making it quite uncomfortable to wear. And the ashes signified desolation and ruin. So the people are assembled, and they're mourning, and they're fasting, and they're repenting, and they're seeking God. And it says in verse 2, And the seed of Israel separated themselves... From all strangers or foreigners, 
and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities or sins of their fathers. With that being said, I'd like to just quickly jump over to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, if you have a Bible, Bible app, you're watching online, whatever the case may be, if you want to, you can go there. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Why 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 through 18? Well, there's a separation here that's going on intentionally with the Israelites. And there should be a separation that goes on with us as Christ followers or those that know the name of Christ. They're intentionally doing this in this time on the 24th day here in the book of Nehemiah. But the principle in the New Testament, Paul speaks of when he's speaking to the Corinthians. And this is an appeal to them, the Corinthians, to separation and cleansing. And he says in chapter 6, starting with verse 14, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? Rhetorical question. We know the answer. None. And what communion has light with darkness? None. And what communion or concord has Christ with Belial? That's the devil. Or what part has he that believes with an infidel or unbeliever? And what agreement, verse 16, has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from amongst them and be ye separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. A separation is happening in Nehemiah. Paul is asking for a separation amongst those that are carnally minded in Corinth. Separation, sanctification. That's what we're required, we're asked to do by our Lord. See, 1 Corinthians, Paul speaks again to the same group, and he says, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Do you remember Samson one of the Nazarite parts of the Nazarite vow was to not touch dead things. And he went and ate honey out of the carcass of a lion. You see, when Christians start to go and touch unclean things, what happens? Well, walking with unbelievers will make you stumble. You will stumble. I've heard the arguments time and time again well, how are we going to be a light? Of course we're supposed to be a light. You know where I stand on evangelism and outreach. Yesterday, like today, a beautiful day outside. So I decided before my family left to take one of my sons to the Red Wings game. And sure enough, as I'm sitting there at the Red Wings game with my son, sipping my lemonade and my Cracker Jacks, both are overpriced, by the way. Next to me was a man, just by himself, and we started just a conversation. His name was Dan, and, and he started mentioning God, but by watching him and listening to him, I don't believe he's born again, based upon his beer consumption and some of the things he was saying. And we started this dialogue, and I gave him one of my bra uh, bracelets that says, Rescue and Revive Ministries, Re repent and believe the gospel. And he was thankful for that. And he got up at one point and came back and had another lemonade for me. You believe that? Brought a lemonade, some Skittles for the kid sitting next to him. Why do I tell you this? We're to be part of the culture. We are to go to Red Wings games, and we are to do things that other people do in the sense as long as it doesn't violate God's commands. But as we go there, I sip the lemonade and he sips the beer. I don't touch the unclean thing. He says the things that are a little bit coarse and I don't. Why? Because 
Our mouths are to be sanctified. Our hands are to be separate. Our feet are to be separate. Come out from amongst them. The Israelites separated themselves. We're to be holy people, a different people. Not a proud, arrogant, self-righteous people, but a holy people, a separate people, so people can see Christ. So people can see Christ. That's why. It says in the book of Leviticus, chapter 10, to be holy. To be sanctified. Right after Nadab and Abihu were struck down for offering up strange fire on the altar. And Aaron, the father, was told to say nothing after his sons were struck down. He said, I will be sanctified in all those that come near unto me. God is holy. We serve a holy God. Part of the problem that we're going to see, and we have seen, is that we live in a culture of Christianity that is not separate. It's just not. Even preachers that I will listen to sometimes online, I'm amazed. Now we're justifying coarse language. We're justifying some preachers using coarse language. No, this is the altar. This is the, the holy place of God. When you come to the house of God, this is a holy place. You're not to be sleeping with people in the temple you ought not to be sleeping with, like Eli's sons were. You're not to be offering up strange fire like Nadab and Abihu were. You're to come out from amongst them. You're to be holy. You're not supposed to be speaking the way the world does. You're not supposed to be justifying your sin. No, holy. Be holy as I am holy, says the Lord. And that's exactly what Paul is explaining and appealing to the Corinthians here. And there is a time where now the Israelites, even after the wall is built and there's a transition, where there's a need to be separate and to fast and to humble themselves and to seek the Lord. And so now we go back to Nehemiah. We go back to Nehemiah chapter 9. And we pick it up. What did they do along with separating themselves from all strangers and confessing their sins and the iniquities of their fathers? Verse 3, it says, And they stood up in their place and read in the book of the law of the Lord their God one-fourth part of the day. And another fourth part they confessed. That's three hours. And then three hours in the Jewish day of the time, 12 hours total. One fourth part of the day confessing. One fourth they're reading. And they worship the Lord. That's what they did. And who, who's the example? Those that are the leaders in the church. Those are the example inside and outside the church walls. The leaders. They're the example. Do you remember when Moses went up to commune with God in Exodus? The leader was gone. And what happened to the people? They made their own God. They started worshiping a molten calf. They started having parties, touching unclean things, doing things they were not supposed to do. They weren't separate any longer. So the leaders always have to be the example. They always have to be the example. Don't tell me that God's okay with you as a church leader doing what everybody else in the world is doing. He's not. 1 Timothy chapter 3 agrees with what I just said. He's not okay with you doing what everybody else is doing and trying to justify your sin. It doesn't work that way. It just doesn't work that way. Now, you may think you have the liberty, let's just say, to gamble. Maybe you do. I don't feel I do. Not if I'm going to stand up here and read this book to you. You may feel you have the liberty to fill in the blank, whatever it is. I don't feel I have that liberty. Because you will follow the leader. God designed people to follow the leader. Christ designed people to imitate others. You know, there's a, a young man joining us today, and I asked him, I said, I, I noticed the southern accent. Said, Where are you from? North Carolina. How do you think he got that southern accent? 
from being around people that live in North Carolina. You will become like those who are around you. Bad company, by the way, will corrupt good manners. You put a nice piece of fruit, a golden apple, in a bucket of rotten apples, and what happens? It becomes rotten. You're not going to be strong enough to be the light. You know, a couple times a year, a few times a year, I'll play golf with some friends I've known for literally almost my whole life. And it's, I have to muster up the courage even to offer to pray on the first tee with them. Say, really, you? Yes, me. Because there's that battle that goes on with the flesh and the spirit. Because I know they're not regenerate, and I am. And most of us aren't strong enough to be the example. You're not strong enough to stand in the fire. I've heard the arguments over and over again. When you hang out, when you're with people that don't know the Lord, what is the purpose of it? What is the purpose of it? Well, certainly Jesus did. But what did he do when he hung out with them? I, I promise you, he, I promise you, he wasn't getting drunk with the drunkards. He was accused of being a glutton and a wine bibber. But I promise you, he wasn't doing those things. He was loving them, serving them, teaching them, being separate amongst them. Why? So that they could come out from amongst them. So that they could be plucked out of the fire. That's why. You have to be very careful. It's a fine line. It's a fine line. They're reading the word of God. They're worshiping. They're confessing their sins. These are all parts of revival. This picks up really from chapter 8. This is all part of bringing life back to the individual and life back corporately to a, to a church body or to a nation that's dead. And the leaders set the example. It says, verse 4, And then stood up upon the stairs of the Levites, Joshua, Benai, Kadmiel, Shabaniah, Bunai, Sherebiah, Benai, Chenani, and they cried with a loud voice unto the Lord their God. Then the Levites, Joshua, Kadmiel, Benai, Hashabaniah, Sherebiah, said, Stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever, and blessed be thy glorious name, which is exalted above all blessings and praise. Look at how they started. They started vertically, worshiping the Lord, just worshiping God. That's how they started. It wasn't a wish list for God. It was an alabaster box broken. It wasn't seeking his hand. It was seeking his face. A problem in the church, a problem in the church at large, but I'll focus in on our beloved country, is that the church is seeking God's hand rather than seeking his face. And you get no results when you do that. Listening to preachers that are telling people, God is going to raise you up. God is going to do these great things in your life. God wants you to have this. God wants you to have that. And all they're saying is this, give me this, God. Give me this. I'll just pray, well, you know, Lord, Father, I would just ask that you could help me with this, and Lord, that you would give me that. And you're just seeking his hand. What about his face? What about the person and the presence of God? Why did this happen? How did the wall get rebuilt? Nehemiah was a man who sought the face of God. He sought the face of God. And the Levites are starting off saying, worship, exalt the Lord. Verse 6, there's a transition. Now this is a long, beautiful prayer that takes place. We're not going to look at all of it today, but we'll look at part of it. It says, thou, verse 6, even thou art Lord alone. Thou hast made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth, and all the things that are therein, the seas, and all that is therein. And thou preservest them all. And the host of heavens worships thee. The Lord, our creator, Genesis. They start at the beginning. The Lord is our creator, Genesis. In the beginning, he spoke into existence, the heavens and the earth. He said, let there be light, and there was light. Verse 7, thou art the Lord, the God, who did choose Abraham and brought him forth out of Ur of the Chaldees and gave him the name of Abraham, God's chosen. Israel was God's chosen people. Abraham, father of nations, father of multitudes, was God's chosen man. You were chosen by God. Jesus said, you have not chosen me. I have chosen you. Chosen by God, the God who chooses, the God who creates. Verse 8, 
and found his heart faithful, Abraham's heart, that is, before thee, and made a covenant with him to give the land of the Canaanites and Hittites and Amorites and Perizzites and Jebusites and the Girgashites to give it, I say, to his seed. And as perform thy words, for thou art righteous, the covenant-keeping God of Abraham. Verse 9, And did see the affliction of our fathers in Egypt and heard their cry by the Red Sea. The merciful God, the God of mercy, the God who creates, the God who chooses, the God who says mercy endures forever. They're acknowledging all this about God, seeking his face. Not once are they asking for anything. They're just seeking the person and the presence of God. Verse 10, and show signs and wonders upon Pharaoh and all of his servants and all the people of his land. For you knew that they dealt proudly against them. So did they get thee a name as it is in this day? I am. I am. Hayah, believe it or not. That's how you say it in Hebrew. Moses says, who do I, who do I say? What do, who do I tell Pharaoh sent me? Tell him, Hayah sent you. I am. I am that I am sent you. I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. I am the vine. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob forever. That's my name. My name is I am. It says in verse 11, And thou did... Divide the sea before them so that they went through the midst of the sea on the dry land and their persecutors you threw into the deeps as a stone into the mighty waters. I am the protector. I mean, think about this for a minute. I was, yesterday I was sitting on my porch for a little while just reading over this text again. And I was just thinking about this for a minute. I was just really think about this. Think about, I am the protector. I am the shield. The, the Egyptians are about to cross literally a sea, a Red Sea. If you believe this, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, if you really believe this, they're about to cross the Red Sea. It says, Moses, just lift up your staff and wave it over, and all of a sudden the Red Sea parts, and the water is just like a wall, and they have this trail like right down the center of this sanctuary, and they start walking into it. Imagine that for a minute. You go down to Lake Ontario, and you just wave over staff in Ontario, just parts, and you walk right into it. And they do this. They walk into it. Well, what does God do? As they're walking, the Egyptians, Pharaoh hearts his heart hardens again. So he says, go get them. And they go out with the chariots and the swords and everything else. And he says, God says, okay, wave your staff again. And the water falls on them, wipes them all out. They're dead upon the shore and protects the Israelites. So here's the thought I had. Really, just listen to me for a moment. If that really happened, if you believe the scriptures, that that literally just happened when I said, why are you so worried about the dollar failing? Why are you so worried about the political arena? Why are you so worried about everything going on in the world? If you believe this just happened, see, you don't believe it. You don't believe that this happened because if you did, this would encourage you and encourage me if I believed it to know that God is our protector. He's our shield. Which one would you rather have? Rumors of the dollar falling or Walking into Lake Ontario with a bunch of people chasing you with guns and swords. Which one do you want? Rhetorical question. Just like Paul said to the Corinthians. Where's your faith? Why do you think like the heathen, Jesus would say? The heathen think like this. The lost think like you, Jesus would say. Why are you so consumed about all these things? I'll tell you one reason. I don't have an on me. Your phone. That's one reason. Your phone. Question to you, challenge to you, what's the first thing you look at in the morning? Come on now. Confess your sin. I'll confess it sometimes. It's my phone. What's the first thing you look at? Is it the Holy Bible or is it the phone? What are you putting in your mind, first thing? Let's be real. 
I'm not going to tell you how great you are. I'd be lying to you if I said that. What are you putting in? What are you feeding your soul? Troubles, anxiety, stress, all these conditions that never existed prior to 10 years ago, 20 years ago, partially because of what we're allowing in, what we're putting in. I don't care if you watch CNN or Fox. Turn them both off. Get in the book. Stop worrying about this politician and that politician and this and that. Get in the book. Worry about your soul. Worry about your family's soul. Start praying. Start fasting. Start seeking God's face, not his hand. I mean, this is the situation we're in. Yet we have preachers telling people how great they are. God help them to see the light. God the protector. Verse 12, moreover, you led them in the day by a cloudy pillar and in the night by a pillar of fire to give them light in the way. Or they should go, I am the way. I am the way. Whose lead are you following? I am the way. Pillar of cloud by day. In case you're wondering, this is where the follow the cloud title came from. It's not some crazy gold dust thing. No, that, this is where it came from. Follow God's lead. Follow his presence. God manifested himself in the Old Testament so the people, his people, could know which way to go. What are you following? What are we following? I know what this guy, look what this guy says. Look what this guy says. I don't care. To be honest with you, I don't care anymore because I know what this book says. I know what this book says. I know what's going to happen already, believe it or not, and it's proven to be true. Since its inception, it's proven to be true. In fact, I've lived a lot of it. I've seen God the protector in my life. I've seen God the provider in my life. I've seen the good shepherd in my life. I've lived it experientially. I've lived it. What more evidence do I need? Verse 13. You came down also upon Mount Sinai and spake with them from heaven and gave them right judgments and true laws, good statutes and commandments. I am the God who speaks. Is God speaking to you? How does he speak to you? Through his holy word? through his Holy Spirit, through others? Are you listening to what he's saying? Yeah, but what about this person? What about this? Well, look, what? Boom, 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 Pinball machine in your mind. You have no peace because you're listening to what everybody else is saying. All those other voices just want to take you away, just distract you, get you off course. God says, you call yourself by my name, and you're doing that. Verse 14, and made known unto them the holy Sabbath. I am the Sabbath. I am your rest. And commandment them precepts, statutes, and laws by the hand of Moses, thy servant. And he gave them bread from heaven for their hunger and brought forth water for them out of the rock for their thirst. Well, what are we going to do? If a famine comes, I don't know, what did the Israelites do? They sought God's face. What happened? Food from heaven. Water from a rock. See, you don't believe it. You don't believe it. And neither do I at times. I'm not alienating you. I'm including myself in this. It comes to a place where you have to say, I either believe the word of God or I don't. I either have faith or I don't. And so I'm just going to stop seeking his face and I'm going to start asking for his hand and in fact, forget God's hand, I'm going to put my hand in it and I'm going to do all these things because I think my thoughts and my ways are higher than his. I'm not telling you not to be a person of action. I'm not telling you not to move on your prayers. I'm telling you, whose voice are you listening to? Whose way are you following? 
Who is your protector? Who is your good shepherd? Who is it? Is it Android or Apple? Is it CNN or Fox? Who is it? That's not, this is not what I planned, by the way, to preach this way today. But I have to trust that I've spent enough time with the Good Shepherd to know what he wants you to hear. I pray you're not condemned. I pray maybe you're convicted, encouraged, instructed in righteousness. The same goes for me. He says in verse 15, and we're going to stop there, and he promised them that they should go in to possess the land which you have sworn to give them. He made a promise to you that you would possess the land. He made a promise to the Israelites they would, and they did, not in the way they thought. When they did it their own way, they kept on going around this mountain. With faith, they entered in, too. Jesus and the church, Joshua and Caleb. We're supposed to be in Canaan. We're supposed to be in the promised land. We're in the the land that's flowing with milk and honey and pomegranates. But guess what? The battles don't end. See, we're losing battles because we're looking to the wrong sources. We're losing battles because we forget. God says, who do I say, who do I say sent me? I am that I am. What does that mean? It means I am your protector. I am the good shepherd. I am the voice you're supposed to listen to. I am the word of God. I am the news that you need. I am the counsel that you need. That's what it means. And they're reciting this prayer, seeking God's face, repenting of their sin, the iniquities of their fathers, the Levites, setting the example for this. Setting the example. Well, let me end with this. This is speaking to Solomon. We all know this passage. I'll read Speaking to Solomon after the completion of the temple is this well-known verse, which we as Christians, by the way, love to quote, but we don't love to live. 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14. Listen now. If, let me stop there, if, conditional. If my people, Christian, little Christ, if my people, which are called by my name, do what? Shall humble themselves and do what? And pray and seek my face and turn from their sins. That's repentance. Turn from their wicked ways. What will happen, God? Then, if then, I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal America. Are we doing the first part? I'm not going to answer that. I know how I'm doing. Not great. Not great. Sometimes better than others, but not great. Step one, humbling yourself. John the Baptist said, he must increase, I must decrease. I'm not worthy to even fasten his shoelaces. You must realize who you are and who God is, number one. And that should cause us to put sackcloth and ashes on, so to speak should cause us to fast, should cause us to pray, should cause us to start seeking his face just for who he is, just for the simple fact that we're here today on a day like this, that he's allowed us to congregate together to worship him. Should cause us to repent, to turn from our wicked ways. And I promise you, God always does his part. He will hear from heaven. He will forgive your sins. Confess your sin. Confess it. If you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive and cleanse from all unrighteousness. He'll heal the land. I know there's crazy stuff going on. I understand that. I know it. I told you in the past, and I'm going to stick by this, I refuse to allow those things going on around me that, yes, are crazy, are evil, are sadistic to take away my peace because I know who I am is. I know who he is. I know he's my protector. He's my provider. 
He's the voice I need to listen to. He's the way I need to walk in. I'm not going to let it take away my peace. What I would ask for is that you would help or join with me, help us together individually corporate, to seek his face, to pray. You know, let me tell you this, what I don't like to do. I'll tell you things I don't like to do in my natural state. Ready? Listen to this. You might be surprised. I don't like to pray. I don't like to fast. I don't like to worship. I don't like to open the Bible. In my natural state, I like none of those things. My flesh actually hates all those things. But when I humble myself and I allow the inner man, when I allow the inner man, the Holy Spirit in me, to open the book, to worship, to fast, and to seek his face, all of a sudden I am shows up. This is a lesson of truth. This is the truth. We must be focused in a time like this. We must be focused. Never lose hope. Never. Never lose hope. Why? Why would you? Never give up. Never. Too many people giving up, losing their faith because of what's going on around them. You, you probably, if, if you're honest, maybe there's someone in here today who's even thought about suicide. Do you think that's I am? No. That's the enemy of your soul. That's not the good shepherd. What does I am give? Life. And that more abundantly. What does I am give? Peace that passes understanding. Who was I am? He's the good shepherd. He's the resurrection and the life. Although you die, you live. Forever. I am is waiting for you. I am that I am is in the heavenlies. Awaiting. Inclining his ear. I will instruct you and guide you in the way you should go. All we need to do is seek his face. Hold on. Be steadfast in the faith. As time gets darker you have this wonderful privilege and opportunity to shine brighter. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for this opportunity today. We know that, uh, beginning with me, we are sinful men and women, only forgiven by God's grace alone and the shedding of the blood of the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. Help us to hold on, to hold fast, to seek your face. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your grace, your love, and your mercy, and your truth. We need it every day, every moment. We thank you that you have given us the power and the privilege to be called the sons of God to as many that believe on your name. Pray that we would bless your name today, worship you. King of kings and Lord of lords, we ask all these things in the name of Christ. Jesus, our Lord, and all of God's beautiful family said, amen. Thank you.